Hello and welcome to Barely Homesteading. This week we want to tell you about what we were able to accomplish in our food production for 2020 and what we have planned for 2021. So 2020 has been an interesting year. We have been doing this YouTube channel for just over a year now. And for those of you who have been with us throughout the year or have watched the introduction, know that we had some goals that we were trying to accomplish with the homestead. And one of those goals was to produce the majority of our food here on site. And so we wanted to uh, spend uh, some time this week talking about what we were able to actually accomplish with our food production. Okay, so before we talk about the, what we were able to produce in the garden, we want to talk about some of the challenges we had this year. So we had our last snow of the 2019-2020 season on June 8th, if I remember correctly. And we had the first snow of the 2020-2021 season on September 8th, which means snow to snow, we had a growing season of 92 days, which is a challenge for any garden. Now we had a lot of, we have a lot of cold crops and we had a lot of crops that were uh, protected from these different storms by either starting things inside or some of the things that we've been able to do outside, but it still affected our production quite a bit. We noticed a lot of our numbers were down this year, even though uh, we've learned a lot, and it just had to do with the weather. Our squash plants got frosted at both ends, lost leaves each time, and so while we did produce squash, they were all smaller, um, and it definitely did impact food. And, and the pumpkins as well, it affected the pumpkins. And so it, the, the numbers are not where we had hoped they would be this year. Those of you who have been with us, Throughout the year, know that our goal was uh, to produce 50% of our food here on the property. And we did not achieve that. We knew we weren't going to. Um, but we wanted to see steady progress toward that goal. And we definitely did see progress, just not quite as much as we had hoped. So uh, here's the numbers. So from the garden, uh, first thing is that we lost not only to the weather, but we also lost to bugs. So we lost all of our broccoli, our cabbage, and our cauliflower to aphids. Which was a real big surprise. We had not really seen any sort of insects in our garden before because of this altitude and this uh, climate. We've never had a problem. But all of a sudden, huge, giant aphid infestations that really cleaned out those three vegetables that we normally get a very large crop from. And this year, we had to throw them all away. Yeah, and unfortunately, because we haven't had this problem before, we weren't looking for it. And so by the time we noticed it, the infestation was immense. Massive. <laughs> and so that's why we lost all of those. So we, this year, we've got some plans uh, that we're, we're going to be putting in place to prevent that from happening, hopefully, this season. Uh, we did get a cantaloupe. It was about the size of a mandarin orange. And so you can see there, you know, just a, a tiny little cantaloupe. And uh, we also got a watermelon that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, those two plants by themselves took up an entire bed. And we got such a small harvest from them that we don't think we're going to do them again this year. Uh, we want to try to maximize our bed space uh, for those crops that are actually doing well. We are still going to be doing some experimenting. Uh, to try to improve things in the future, but the cantaloupes and the watermelon just didn't work out well enough uh, for us to sacrifice an entire bed uh, at this point in our journey. In the future, as we get more beds and uh, do a little bit better production and some other things, we may uh, come back to them and see if we can get some short season uh, melons to grow, uh, but this upcoming year, we're just not going to try it. No, in the future when we get the hoop house ready and it's a little warmer, I would like to try some vertical, growing them up um, trellises to help save the safe. And in that warmer climate, I think we might get better crop. Um, but this year, we're just we're not in a position to have that hoop house ready at the beginning of the season. 
And so we're going to try to maximize our space and put those off for a couple of years. Yep. So uh, our first big crop was carrots. We got a lot of carrots and they grew really well. And so you can see there we got, you know, over 32 pounds of carrots. And we actually are, have been talking about our carrots and some things that we might be able to do this year with some of the greenhouses and the movable tops. Uh, we've actually talked about the possibility of trying to do uh, two seasons of carrots, starting a couple of beds early with the tops. And then as it warms up, we can move those to other beds uh, that we will be putting on uh, or we'll be putting colder crops into those beds. And then in the fall, being able to start another season of carrots and then finishing them off with those tops as the weather starts to cool off. Last year we did a staggered start. We did some and then about four weeks later and four weeks later. But the ones at the beginning just did not do as well. And we think if we put them in the greenhouse or with some toppers on to keep them warm that they'll do better. And if we can get two full crops, I think that'll help maximize. Yep. yep. Uh, and then celery. Celery did fairly well. Uh, wasn't a big producer, you know, as far as cost goes or weight, uh, but the, the celery did do fairly well. And so we're going to continue with celery because it's a, a good uh, crop. We didn't quite get a pound of celery. Well, the variety that we grow up here, uh, we don't get the big stalks of celery. It's, it's a Chinese celery that's almost more like an herb. And actually what we did with what we got is we dehydrated it and ground it all up. And I use it kind of like celery powder or celery salt to season our soups and our, our food as mm -hmm. opposed to um, having a nice big stock of celery. And that's yep. just due to the climate. Yeah, just the variety that we use. Uh, next we got the cucumbers. Cucumbers did fairly well. We grew them inside a bed with those greenhouse toppers. And so they were able to stay quite warm. And we got a couple of very big... Uh, cucumbers, we were trying to grow a couple of them very large so we could get our own seeds uh, to be able to kind of produce a crop up here that would be more cold tolerant uh, over the different seasons. We did get some seeds. Oh, no, they didn't. No, they none of, we, we tried, but none of the seeds were viable. Okay. Um, they just weren't developed enough to be able to actually grow. Um, but we'll try again next year, hope, hope for a little bit longer than 90 day season, and we'll see. Yeah. With the, with the, um, Cold frame toppers, we got our best crop of cucumbers oh, yeah. yet up here. And and we had, I mean, for as often as we eat cucumbers, what we got last year really uh, met our needs. Mm -hmm. um, we are hoping that this year, again, with the toppers, we'll be able to grow enough to not only have fresh cucumbers, but they will also be able to pickle do and uh, do some pickles. Uh, garlic, unfortunately, our garlic, because of the season, the uh, winter, uh, we did not get our garlic in the ground when we were supposed to. So up here, we tried to get our garlic in the ground the fall before and let it sit in the ground all winter and develop. And then in the spring and summer, it grows and we get a decent garlic crop. Well, the fall before, uh, so it would have been 2019 fall, we got surprised by the early snow and just didn't get our garlic in the ground. So we did not get a very big garlic crop this year. We got enough to plant for next year, but that was about it. Yeah, and so uh, we did get our garlic in uh, this year. We made sure of that, and so we're hoping to get a good garlic crop this year. All right, so uh, next we've got green beans, and green beans are another big producer up here, uh, colder weather crop. And our green beans, we got over 10 pounds of green beans. And one of the reasons we got so many green beans is we planted two varieties of beans. We planted a climbing variety in the center of our bed that climbed up the trellis. And then we planted a row of bush beans on either side of that in the bed to maximize the bed usage. And so we got a, a good amount of green beans. Mm -hmm. And I think if we add a little bit more space, give them a little bit more room somewhere else to grow, maybe do some climbing green beans on uh, around the edges on the fence. Because I don't think at this point we're quite getting a year supply for our family of six. Not quite. So it'd be nice to expand that a little bit, but we're getting a pretty good crop for the space that we've planted so far. Yeah. And so we actually may end up putting in another bed with a trellis so that we can have another green bean bed and uh, double our production. 
Uh, next is green peppers. We had a fairly good green pepper crop for up here. Uh, green peppers are a warmer climate crop, and we actually started uh, our green peppers. Uh, we, we've done green peppers every year, but we've never gotten a decent crop of them. What we did this year, we started them as normal, and then when we built our second set of greenhouse toppers for our beds, we put those on the bed with the green uh, peppers and the cucumbers, and the green peppers did really well with those toppers. So we're hoping that this year, if we can start them off with those toppers, that we will actually get a very good green pepper pop, uh, crop. Uh, lettuce, lettuce always does really well up here, although this year it did not do as well as pe previous years, and I think, again, that has something to do with the weather. Our early crop did quite well. We had a lot of lettuce in the spring, but our fall crop um, did not do as well. It just got too cold too fast, and even the, the light snows that we had didn't kill them, but they just could not grow. Yep. Uh, onions, we didn't have a great onion crop this year, and I think part of that is because uh, what we've done in the past is, again, we've planted onions, and then we've let some of them sit all winter, and then let them grow a second season and harvest them then. And I don't think we had any that did that last year. Uh, we had some that did that, but the problem with the onions this last year, um, we didn't have very many that did that, but we had old seeds. We yeah, had old, old starts, bulbs. old bulbs. And so they just, and the soil that they were in was not great. And so it just was a combination of a lot of things and they just didn't work really well. Yeah, and so that is one thing that we definitely are hoping is going to improve our crop this year is we put in a lot of compost in our beds and we're going to turn them all up again before the spring planting. But our, uh, our small beds around the perimeter, uh, we're going to get all of those turned up uh, that don't have garlic in them or something else so that we can get some compost in there because the soil in those aren't great. We put a little bit of compost in the fall, but more in the spring would be good. Yeah. And, and I would just like to point out the importance of having good quality seeds when you plant. Um, you think, oh, I'll save some money, I'll buy, buy these older ones or the cheaper ones. Um, but that it is not always good. It's, yeah, it's not trying to get what you pay for. And we have found that when we pay for these seeds that are geared towards short seasons, we get a better crop. Okay. Uh, next we got peas. Peas are another good crop. Um, we got a fairly decent crop of peas this year, not quite a pound of shelled peas, uh, but a, a good crop. That's another crop that we're thinking about maybe uh, putting in another bed with a trellis to be able to get more peas. Uh, we weren't really impressed with the variety of peas that we've been growing, and so we're going to be looking to get a, a different variety this year uh, to try to make uh, better use of the, of the bed that we have. Yeah, the, the variety we used this last year just didn't produce as much and didn't, the plants were much smaller than some of our other peas that, or that we've had in the past, so. Yep. Uh, next we got potatoes. Potatoes did really well. Uh, we think we finally figured out uh, the problems that we've been having with the potatoes, which has been drainage. Um, potatoes like water, but they don't like to sit in water. And so we've had some drainage issues uh, with the containers that we've been putting them in. And this year, I think we solved that. Uh, uh, definitely better. I think it's going to, we can still tweak it. Yeah, we, we're still going to try to improve. But we definitely, you know, we got uh, almost 18 pounds of potatoes, uh, which From is just definitely. just a few plants. Yeah. We didn't plant we, that many. It was, what, five? Five maybe, or six plants? Maybe at most. Yeah. So definitely better. And, and now that we kind of know uh, what we've done wrong in the past, hopefully if we plant more, we'll be able to get more. As we mentioned, pumpkins did not do as well this year because of the late snow and frosts. Uh, we only got <clears throat> about 14 pounds of pumpkins. Not very big, uh, so not a great crop uh, for pumpkins. Sunflowers uh, did not produce this year. It was just too short of a season. They yeah, didn't have enough cold. time. Yeah, just a cold, su cold summer. Yeah. Uh, tomatoes. So tomatoes were our... Uh, our big surprise crop this year, the greenhouse, the, the mini greenhouse that we put in, we had four tomato plants in there. and No, we only had three. No, there were four. There were four poles. We had two of one variety, one of the heirloom, and one of the cherry. Oh, you're right. Four. 
Uh, so our tomatoes in that greenhouse really did well, much better than we've ever had up here. Uh, and as you can see, we got over 21 pounds of tomatoes. Now, tomatoes are a, a water-heavy crop, so they're going to be heavier anyway. Uh, but we got our first crop of tomatoes that we could actually do something with. Um, we were able to bottle some tomatoes. Yeah, we bottled some. We were able to use some in our salads. Um, in the past, all of the tomatoes we've gotten are usually all green, and we have to let them sit uh, to ripen off the vine. This year, we didn't do that. We, we were able to let them ripen on the vine and, and we got a good crop. So we're looking actually at putting in, not this year, but in the future, another bed dedicated to tomatoes uh, that we can try to maximize the space and the heat and even do better. Uh, turnips uh, did really well. This was the um, first year we've grown, grew, we've tried to grow turnips and so we were figuring things out, and it was a little yeah. bit of a surprise, but they did. They really did well in our climate, and our kids actually really liked eating them. And yeah, it Mama, just out. Mama Bear and I didn't grow up. Neither of our families, when we were growing up, did turnips. And so turnips were a crop we've never been used to, uh, but we heard that they did well, and so we tried them, and they actually grew really well, and we found some ways to use them that our family actually eats. So yeah. it's been good. Uh, watermelon, as I said, watermelon, we got a watermelon about the size of a softball. Some grapefruit, maybe. Um, and it, it was tasted okay. Oh, yeah, it tasted fine. It was just small. And so wasting half a bed on a, a, water, or a watermelon that's the size of a softball just really wasn't efficient. So, again, we're going to not do the watermelons, uh, at least immediately. Uh, winter squash, as Mama Bear said, uh, was affected by the late frost again. Uh, we did get over 25 pounds of squash, but we usually get even more. And so this year was just a bad year for a lot of things. And uh, squash is another one of those plant, uh, crops that do really well up here usually. And so we're hoping this year to get a much better squash crop. And we're actually going... Winter squash does well up oh, here. Oh, yes, sorry. We've Winter tried squash. some summer squash, some butter, uh, butternut. butternut, and have not been able to really get them to grow or produce much at all. Yeah, that's true. It's the winter squash. That does the well. acorn squash we've mm -hmm. had good success with. Yep. So that is uh, what we have been able to grow uh, in the garden this year. Now, in addition to that, we were able to uh, do a lot of our own processing of a, diff a number of different things. That we didn't necessarily grow here, um, but we had uh, them given to us. And thanks, so they, Mom and Dad. Yeah, th thanks, Mom and Dad. Uh, and so we were able to bottle a bunch of pears and a lot of apple jam, apple pie filling, and apple sauce. And so uh, all of those helped us out with our, uh, you know, getting our food production up. And then all of our pumpkins, we actually canned all of our pumpkins this year. And so uh, the, the uh, pumpkin production you see there uh, with the other canned goods. And then our chickens, which we've already talked about. We did a video especially on our chickens. And, and we can link to that below. And we're going to link to that uh, uh, with uh, the chickens that we did this year. They didn't quite pay off as far as the cost of raising them versus the meat that we got from them. Part of that is the breed of chicken that we got. Uh, we went for a breed of chicken that was more uh, hardy in this climate, slower growing, and it wasn't really a meat uh, variety, and so they were all smaller uh, when we processed them. You know, when you get a, a good broiler chicken, you're expecting, you know, six, seven pounds, and I think our biggest one was about four and so they, they just weren't as uh, efficient uh, for our usage. So we're looking at different varieties that will also uh, be specifically for meat, but also hardy for our climate and a little slower growing. Because up here at 8,000 feet, if you get a regular meat bird uh, with the lesser, uh, the lower oxygen content, you can actually have a lot of heart problems and you'll have chickens dying before they're quite ready to process. And that's just even worse than getting a small bird. Now, our turkeys were another surprise. Uh, we did two turkeys this year. 
And as you saw with our Thanksgiving video, which we can also link here, uh, our turkeys did fantastic. Uh, our Tom, I didn't weigh him before processing, but after processing, uh, he was huge. <laughs> he, he was actually so big we couldn't fit him in our cone, and we had to buy a larger cone, which he then still didn't fit in and yeah. kind of sort of broke. Yeah. And so, but after he was processed and plucked, the cooking weight of him was 27 pounds. Yeah. So uh, definitely, we're, we're definitely looking at chick or, uh, turkeys again, uh, doing them this year, and maybe upping the number of turkeys that we do. So we did two, one male and one female. Uh, the tom was rather big. The female was not as big, but she was still a pretty good size when we processed She was about her. nine pounds. Um, and so we are, are looking to do maybe more this year uh, and see if we can get a couple of different males. Uh, because if we can, uh, so with the turkey that we did for Thanksgiving, uh, we cook them up and then all of the leftover meat we shred and freeze so that we have shredded uh, poultry meat uh, to be able to put in other meals. And it works out really well, uh, simplifies cooking. It does. It's, it's very nice to be able to, if, when you have a busy day, you know, back before coronavirus when we would have music lessons or whatever, we would just come home, pull out some pre-cooked shredded chicken, throw it in with some vegetables. We could serve it over rice or over pasta or just make up some, mix up some chicken enchiladas really yep, quick. Yeah, chicken enchiladas are big. It was just a real time saver for those busy weeknights when you have a lot going on with four kids. Yep. So uh, definitely looking at doing some more turkeys. So lastly, we have our egg production. So our hens did an amazing job last year in producing eggs. We approximate that we got uh, 90 dozen eggs for the year, uh, which we were flush with eggs at the beginning of the pandemic when all of the stores, at least in this area, were completely out. Uh, so you know, big thanks to our hens. <laughs> and we actually have, at least going into this year, we have even more hens than we had last year. So we picked up three additional hens uh, to try to you know, get them to an age where they're producing as our other hens are getting old and are starting to not produce quite as much because uh, we want to keep that up. Now, in October, our hens started a very hard molt. <laughs> um, yeah. They, I mean, they lost all their feathers. They were little naked chicken run, running around. And so uh, we lost egg production. But they, it started to decline in October, and we lost it pretty much for November, December. Yeah, November, December, we got almost no eggs. So we're actually, we have created some egg tracking sheets. We're going to try to keep better track of exactly how many we get this year and um, try to keep track of those things like molting and weather that affect their laying. Yep. Uh, but as I said, we've got some more hens, so hopefully our egg production will be even higher this year uh, because that was definitely a cost uh, plus for us, uh, they definitely gave us more eggs than they uh, ate in chicken feed. So as you can see, uh, our total uh, poundage, at least for weight, was about 570 pounds of food, either produced or processed here on site. And when you look at how much food an adult and you know, our four children eat in a year, uh, it's about 7,200 pounds of food. And that's an estimate based on that, that's, different things yeah, that's that we found an, online. It's an estimate. Um, obviously, we're not weighing everything before we eat it. <laughs> um, but uh, that, that's probably pretty close. And so we are at about 8% from a weight perspective uh, last year of what we produced versus what we consumed. From a cost perspective, now costs fluctuate, right? Uh, any week, grocery stores are going to have things on sale, uh, and so costs are going to fluctuate depending on the season, and, and but they're to particularly pushing at that time. Uh, so this is just a snapshot on cost. Uh, so this week, we went out to our local grocery store website and looked up the prices of all of these different things. And so uh, it looks like, based on this week's prices, we produce $750 worth of food here on site, uh, which if you look at the cost of what we spend in a year on food, uh, it's about 9%. So we're right there at about 8-9% for last year of what we produced versus what we consumed. 
Now, if we wouldn't have lost the uh, broccoli and a, uh, broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower, those numbers definitely would have been higher because um, mm -hmm. those are usually fairly large producing crops. We actually yep. had a, a good crop of all of them going before the aphids. Yep. And we just we went to pick them and noticed, oh, what are all these little gray spots on them? And huh, well, guess what? Yeah. So if, if we would have gotten those three crops, we probably would have been over 10%. Um, but we're still experimenting, we're still learning, and so this year we are hoping to do much better. Uh, I personally have a goal to try to be up around 20%, but if we can just make 15, that would be great. So what are we doing to uh, help with that? Well, one of the things that we're going to do is the hoop house that you saw us build before that first snowstorm in September. We're going to try to turn that into a permanent greenhouse. And so that will allow us to uh, have two more beds uh, within an enclosed area to lengthen the growing season on those two beds and to protect them from uh, predators, you know, birds and voles and things. And so we're hoping to improve our production with that. Also, we're not going to do the cantaloupe and the watermelon, which is going to free up an entire bed. Uh, and we also talked about the two seasons of carrots that we're going to do to try to improve our production of food this year. A couple of other things that we're talking about doing, and jump in at any point, uh, we are talking about doing some climbing uh, production with our squash and our pumpkins. And so we have, uh, as you've seen, we've got fencing all around the uh, garden area, and we've got the hoop house. And so we're going to try to get some of those vine plants to grow up instead of out so that we maximize more of our space. In addition, we're going to be trying to plant some pumpkins in containers so that we're not utilizing an entire bed with all of the vines from the pumpkins. We can just put them in a container and then have the vines go out over uh, soil that we're not using for planting. Yeah. Um... One thing also that we did in the fall was we got a bunch of manure from some friends that have horses. There's fortunately a lot of people up here that have livestock and are more than willing to share mm -hmm. the the manure that sits around because they don't know what to do with it and they don't have anywhere to put it, so they like to give it to us. And So the more nutrient-filled and the healthier the soil is, the more the plants will produce without yes. needing more plants. Now, one thing I will say about manure, especially horse manure, is horse manure is hot. It's very nitrogen rich, and so you need to put it in the soil way before you're going to be planting in that soil. You can't just take horse manure and spread it out on your plants. It's going to kill the plants. So what we did is we put all of that manure in last fall, and it's been sitting all winter long, decomposing and going into the soil. And so by next spring, when we're ready to plant, uh, the soil will actually be ready for the planting. And it was already partially decomposed before we put it in the beds. But it was still pretty hot. <laughs> uh, it wasn't too bad. Um, but if it's like fresh day of manure, you, you really need to let it sit for, I think, uh, I looked it up one time, but it was maybe 6 to 12 months. Yeah. And so it, it really does. But if you can get some that's partially decompose some of the older stuff from a neighbor and then put it in your beds in the fall and let it just really mix into that soil and mm -hmm. you know as the water and the snow melt into the soil it helps it disperse all the nutrients and it really just helps improve that soil and that soil is the key to healthy plants yes and so the healthier your soil the more food you will produce regardless of how much space you have yeah uh, the other thing is last year we actually found worms uh, earthworms in our beds, which is a sign that you have healthy soil, and so we're hoping that those earthworms have, uh, that they've grown and have multiplied and will uh, help us get some even better soil this year. And it, it was looking much better at the end of uh, last fall uh, when we turn it over this spring. Hopefully it'll be nice and rich and brown. So we've got, we've got more compost in our compost piles that we think we might be able to get out this spring and, um, uh, we're definitely going to be watching the insects more um, now that we, we are aware that there was some. And apparently aphids can even overwinter in the soil. So we're definitely going to go out and hit them hard this spring with some nice insect organic insecticidal soap um, and see if we can knock some of them out. We're also going to be 
moving we we've always moved the beds around a little bit mm -hmm. um crop rotation but i think we're going to be making some more drastic changes to our crop rotation to try to uh, make sure that um, plants that aren't going to be quite as affected by the aphids are in those spots where we had aphids before. And we're also going to be planting some other things in those beds uh, that attract the aphids uh, so that the aphids will be attracted to those, I'll say, sacrificial plants. Trap plants. Trap plants. And uh, once we see them on the trap plants, then we can get out the uh, organics, uh, insecticides, insecticidal soaps, and kill them before they actually get onto our crops. Or, uh, depending on what the plant is, you can actually, once, all the, once it's got a bunch of aphids on it, you just pull it up and remove it from the situation if you don't want to even use organic insecticidal soaps. Yep. Um, so those are some, yeah, some of the things that we've been planning and hoping to do this year. Um, Trying some different companion plantings, trying to maximize um, some space which plants yep. can grow together that complement each other or can grow up each other or because some are early and some are late that they are bigger at different times of the year so they work in the same space well, things mm -hmm. like that. And then the other thing that we were talking about doing is uh, improving or increasing our meat production. So we're going to be getting uh, more chickens, more turkeys. Uh, they did well enough that we're going to continue with that, but we're also hoping this year to be able to get uh, rabbits and start producing some rabbits here on site. And uh, we've also, although it won't help with this year's production, we've also been talking about getting some sheep. And so uh, the goats, <laughs> you've seen the videos with the goats, uh, we have finally gotten a fencing solution for our pastures that keep the goats in and the goats have been really good at teaching us how to raise animals. Uh, goats are very hardy, uh, they're fairly low maintenance, but they are troublesome. And so we've learned a lot from the goats and now that we've got uh, a situation with our pastures that we think is going to work, we're looking into getting sheep and if we start breeding our own sheep and processing sheep as we have them, that's going to also uh, produce uh, far more mo uh, meat and uh, get our food production up. Now, one thing we were unable to do this last fall is uh, we were unable to breed our goat, our female goat. And we chose not to because we were unable to get our um, loafing shed in our shelter, the one that we wanted down there. We have a shelter for him, but it's not great, and it was just not a place where we thought that she could have a baby this spring and, and raise a baby and it would have been very difficult for us to get in there to, to, milk, her. to milk her or be there with her. Um, so we would like to, this fall, try to breed her so that the next spring we not only can have the kid, but we can also get the some goat's milk. Uh, we would like to, with that, do a lot of goat milk soap and start producing all our own soap. And then we're as, as well as goat milk cheese, which our two lactose intolerant daughters should be able to eat easier. Well, yes, but I was going to use all the goat milk for soap, and we were going to milk our sheep for cheese. Oh, all right. But, you know, we'll see how it goes. We may change that plan. All right. So, uh, big plans for the year, and uh, Mama Bear is already getting really excited to get out in the garden. And so we are very hopeful that this year we're going to have a great year. Uh, 2021 will be a fabulous year on the home, Fairly Homestead, not only for garden, but also for the other things that we're trying to do. And so we hope that you will join us on our journey this year and uh, support us. And you can do that by liking and subscribing to our channel. Yep. So please do. And I would like to offer a word of warning before we close out. Oh. For anybody who would like to try garden or possibly animals this year, you need to start looking into it now. It's January, there's snow on the ground in most places or cold weather in most places, but because of the uncertainty in the world, a lot of things um, are just harder to find. And I've noticed as I have been purchasing seeds for our garden, there are already things that are sold out. So if you are going to be looking for seeds for your garden, don't put it off too long. If you want to order chickens, you don't have to get them now, but you put in your order to be delivered at a certain point um, because they, they only hatch a certain number of chickens. And once they're done, they're done. And so you may want to, if you would like to do that this year, 
you need to start looking into it now. Tanning supplies have been scarce since last summer. Um, so start looking now a little bit here, a little bit there, building your supply of whatever it is you need for whatever goals that you have. Yeah. Uh, try to keep your goals manageable. If this is new to you, don't try to do everything at once. I mean, we've gardened for years. Um, so while we're learning a new climate, at least we have some experience with gardening. We didn't jump into brand new gardening and brand new animals and everything all at the same time. So decide what your goals are. Decide what you, what you need to reach those goals. And start now, start, you know, looking for things a step at a time, getting ready so that when the warm weather is here, you're already ready to go. Yeah, good advice. All right. So uh, with that, uh, this uh, is Lumberjack for Barely Homesteading and Mama Bear. And we would like to wish you all a happy new year. And if you would like, let us know what your goals are for 2021 down in the comments below. And with that, please like and subscribe, and we will see you throughout the year. Remember, use it up, wear it out, make it do, or do without. Bye. Bye.